nice to meet you. I always see you on TV, man. Nah, well. I'd have to touch you. Mm -hmm. Fresh. So are you sending all this today? Okay? Every day, uh, you want to come in this, okay? Mm -hmm. Can I take it? Yeah, I want to take it. I don't think you're going to hide it. Yeah. All right, come on now, sir. Thank you and all the best. All right. Are you, are you, living, are you living up the road? Yes, I'm living up on the prospect side. You traveled that way this morning. Out of all the Caribbean islands plundered and conquered by the British, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was one of the last to be colonized and the only territory that has recorded less than a century under the system known as chattel slavery. While African enslaved people on the neighboring islands such as Barbados, Grenada and St. Lucia were toiling on sugarcane, cotton and tobacco plantations for more than 130 years, slavers had just begun to import captured Africans into the island named by the indigenous people as Hyruna, land of the blessed. Today, the island is a tourist destination where the wealthy of Europe flock to relax and enjoy the paradise of island life. The memory of the millions of Africans who were stolen from their homes and forcefully transported to the Caribbean as enslaved, chattel, property of Europeans, have now faded away. British military commanders were given official instructions to eliminate the native Kalinago Garifuna communities. The natives mounted fierce resistance to the colonial effort, fighting the British forces in the First and Second Carib Wars. The resistance was eventually suppressed after six years. As punishment, the British rounded up thousands of black Caribs and exiled them to the island of Baliso, where starvation wiped out many of their numbers. The survivors who remained were left traumatized, some landless and most still living on the fringes of the island. When you look at the history of the West Indies, St. Vincent is almost like a footnote. But there are so many things that are important about St. Vincent that it needs to be given much more prominence. Britain never had total control of St. Vincent until the banishment of the Garifuna people in 1797. By that time, most of the original Caribs, or what they call Kalinago people, had died off. The only remaining St. Vincent, and the remaining St. Vincent, because they had cohabited and intermarried with escaped African slaves. In any fort, you're expecting attacks from the sea. So your cannons are pointed looking for enemies, the French or whoever. In the case of St. Vincent, they were torn inland because the real enemies were really the Garifuna, the indigenous people, who were not coming in boats, but who were inland. That was how it was originally built. It was meant to deal with people who were attacking inland. British planters eyed the virgin lands on the windward side of the island where these Kalinago Garifuna communities had settled. Eight estates were established on native lands. With them now banished, sugar production on the island bloomed. From 1795 to 1796, those are two large wars fought. So that struggle even though it had died out in other countries in the Caribbean, continued in St. Vincent until 1796, when they were defeated, forced to surrender. But the majority of them were banished from St. Vincent and sent to Central America, to Rotan, which is a small island just off Honduras. And today, they call themselves, the original name, the Garifuna. 
So the Garifuna in Central America, mainly in Belize, Guatemala, um, Nicaragua, and Honduras, they see St. Vincent as the ancestral homeland because their ancestors came from St. Vincent, those who were banished in 1797. So St. Vincent is very important in that while in Barbados from the 1640s, it did not really begin in St. Vincent until 1766. So we had a shorter period on the slavery and a shorter period producing sugar than in most of the other islands. Most of the planters who lived lavishly off the profits of the sugar estates never set a foot on the island and instead chose to employ estate managers. By the mid-1820s, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was one of the leading sugar producing colonies, second only to Jamaica, supplying almost 15,000 tons to England by 1828. However, the sugar high was short-lived as the estates were crushed by a series of natural disasters, including hurricanes and volcanic eruption. There were frequently storms in St. Vincent, major eruption in 1812. You had a hurricane in 1831. All of these affected the, the plantations, or well, in, in St. Vincent, we call them estates. The period during which the war was fought, 1795 to 1796, um, there was a lot of damage to estates and that is why it is surprising that St. Vincent was able to become a major producer despite this. So you have the, you have the wars and soon after the wars you have the 1812 eruption and the 1831 hurricane. But some of the planters were compensated but of course the, the slaves didn't get compensated, they just continued to, li to live their, their lives. The enslaved Africans imported into the island between 1763 and 1808 were dispersed in a hundred estates across the island. Estate managers were free to administer punishment on the enslaved in whatever form they deemed necessary. This including beatings, whippings, mutilation and even execution. Most of the field slaves on the island were women, and they received the brunt of the torture. The appointment of stipendary magistrates to the island to oversee the apprenticeship period after emancipation did little to improve the conditions for the African population. Frequent complaints of overworking and beatings for minor infractions, such as arriving late to the field, were recorded in the diaries of the magistrates, now stored in the National Archives. Slavery was slavery, okay? There might have been differences because during the period when St. Vincent really became fully under, under slavery, you are beginning to have voices in England speaking about the brutalities of slavery and um, so the planters had to be concerned about how they did with it given, given the fact that people were speaking out about slavery and in fact there was a lady called Carmichael, Alison Carmichael who owned an estate which at that time was called the Mouse Bank Estate, M-O-U-S-E-B-A-N-K, which is in the Kane Hall area and she wrote a book based on her experiences in St. Vincent and what she was really attempting to do was to convince the British people, especially those who were speaking out against slavery, that slavery in St. Vincent was not as bad. Slavery was slavery, and some of the old slave laws which existed in other islands were put in place in, in St. Vincent. The handful of Afro-Indigenous people who remain on the island became an integral part of the sugar production process on the island, despite not being part of the chattel slavery system. Their work involved transporting the sugar from the estates by canoe to ships in the harbour. Comes in of this Black Point um, cave in um, um, just off Georgetown. And what happened is that the owner of the largest, what was then the largest estate in St. Vincent called Grand Sable Estate, built this tunnel which allowed them to take sugar from the Georgetown side to the Byra side, which was considered um, calmer 
and easier for the canals to take out the take out the sugar. So that, that was the role they performed during slavery. Others relocated to the interior of the island to a community known as Greggs, a fortified and remote maroon town that the British were not able to penetrate. Here, you can find survivors of the once powerful Kalinago Garifuna nation, the original inhabitants of most of the Lesser Antilles. Small remnants of the Kalinago Garifuna communities are still intact in the northern part of the island. The descendants of the group of people who landed on the island of Roatan in 1779, as well as those who remained in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, are today called the Garifuna people. However, in their native land, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, from as early as age three, students are instructed in the use of the King's English. No lessons are taught about the native language. Even the older generation holds no memories of their mother tongue. The language of the indigenous people has been completely erased. I even just lay down from my bed and even think about who I really related to, who is my people them, where I really from, if I really original from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Because I'm a black Indian. My, I get the Indianness from my grandmother, not from my mother. My, mo my grandmother was a black Indian, very black Indian. And that's where I get the Indianness from. So when they began to sell lands, the, the lands owned by the Caribs, when they began to sell land, they attracted quite a number of people from the Leeward Islands because the Leeward Islands is an area without a lot of water and so on. And, and these people felt that they had better prospects coming to St. Vincent. And there was also the connection, the British connection, the Scots in particular, the Welsh, the Irish and so on, had connections throughout the Caribbean. And through those connections, they were able to advertise what lands were there. And by the time the British started producing sugar in St. Vincent, sugar in the Caribbean had long established itself. A lot of the planters in the other islands made enormous fortunes and went to live in England. So some of these new proprietors who came to St. Vincent were expecting a similar thing. Some of them did not come to St. Vincent at all. They were able to use managers and so on to run the estates, but their hope was that the profits from the estates would help to sustain, not only to sustain them in England, but to allow them enough money to invest in whatever else they wanted to invest. And we have, for instance, an example of proprietors from St. Vincent who were able to establish um, properties, well-renowned properties and so on in different parts of the UK. Thomas Phillips, who had bought the Camden Park estate. Although in the case of Phillips, Phillips was a wealthy man before he came to St. Vincent. He made money um, in the East, in, in India. But he got compensation, and that compensation might have been part of what he used to invest or to, to um, contribute to the, the university in, in Wales. Camden Park was not one of the most profitable estates operating on the island. When emancipation came in 1834, the estate was owned by a wealthy retired surgeon from Wales. He made a brief visit to the island, increased his land holdings and his slave stock, and left the plantation under the charge of the Whittall brothers. After countless rebellions had rocked the British West Indies and the constant protests of abolitionists in the English court, Britain decided to use 40% of its national budget in 1833 to buy freedom for all enslaved people in the empire. That is equivalent to about 20 billion pounds in currency today, making it one of the largest government bailouts. On August 1st, 1834 in Kingstown SVG, 2,959 children under the age of six were freed immediately and so were 1,189 people. Over 1.6 million pounds 
was paid to planters for compensation for the 18,102 slaves that became apprentices thereafter. Phillips was one of those planters who received compensation from the crown for the 126 enslaved human beings he owned. He also received four years of free labor from the former enslaved. Through his involvement in the slave trade, we can see the direct legacy of the forced labor of enslaved Africans and the enrichment of planters overseas. But the influence of the Welsh on the island is seen and felt in other areas as well. The copper that was used to secure the hull of the ship, the fabric that clothed them, the iron chains, collars, and even the currency that was used to buy them all came from Wales. But even more curious is the presence of many popular Welsh family names among the Vincentian population, which suggests that the connection runs deeper than we may imagine. Once they know that two persons could speak the same language, for the most part, they separated them. They separated them because they were fearful of, these, of, of the traditions of the Africans. The colonizers were superior with, with weaponry, but you could never take your eyes off a person with a one book. <laughs> so they, they used to ensure that they, in order to keep down all the rebellions and all the insurrections, you know, they separated them, divorced the, the language, they would put, if they know you from this tribe, you go in and, and some, they ain't putting two of you together in, in most of the tribes, you know. And that's how, the, that's how they gave us their names. They, they actually gave us their names, Scott and, and, and all the, the titles we have. Those names are not our names originally. We would have been, we would have been Jakadura, uh, Babadura, whatever it is. That's how we were, we were brought up in, in those countries, but when, once we got here, Whoever bought us as slaves, or whoever took us on their plantation, we got their names. I don't think most of our people today study where we came from. We don't realize that we are, we are descendants of slaves or whatever. You. you can't tell us now that we're slaves because people here would be violent against that, you know. They don't want to hear, but I'm, I am so-and-so, you know, don't tell me I'm no slave. Man, they don't want to hear that. But the truth is, we are descendants. And it, it, it is so funny that nobody has been showing an interest in maintaining the culture and the identities that we had. Because the world is, is civilizing, it's a, it's a global village, it's civilizing so fast. And it, it's so civilizing in a way that certain people want it to. And that's part of our dilemma. With the estates never having recovered fully after the disasters, they were auctioned off to recoup unpaid loans that Britain had given to estate owners. The desire for land ownership among the African population was growing, but without financial resources, they were cut off from participating in the land grab. Phillips died in 1851, and he left his estate to a John and Richard Whittall. His wife, Anne Whittall, she inherited the estate when he died. Now, Anne Whittall, we know up to 1879, 1880, she still owned, she still owned the estate. Now there is an issue, um, mention was made of, of um, Porter owning the estate. I'm not too sure at what point Porter owned the estate because 1979, and Whittell still owned um, Camden Park. Now in 1902, um, there's an Alex Fraser, who had owned the Camden Park estate and he died at Orange Hill during the eruption. That's 1902. I'm not too sure what happened after, but the important thing about 1902 with the eruption was that during the eruption, the government bought pieces, of, well, a part of the Camden Park estate in order to settle refugees from Sandy Bay and Wallibu that during the period 1845 to 1847, you had some Portuguese immigrants from um, Madeira who came to St. Vincent and some of them were settled on the Camden Park estate. Also in 1861, when the Indians started, East Indians started arriving, some of them were also settled on Camden Park estate, 1942 when the government purchased the, the whole estate. 
And part of it was mainly, well, most of it was mainly for an agricultural experimental station. And uh, part also was supposed to be sold to laborers on the estate. So they gave out some land or sold that lands to some of the laborers on the estate. But the majority of it remained the Camden Park estate, which was now no longer privately owned, owned by government and used as an experimental station. We know that in um, 1911, we first, references first made to the Camden Park village. And that is because in 19, sorry, the 19, the census in 1911 made reference to the Camden Park village. And that is because in 1902, they had settled people here. But after 1942, you had more and more laborers, settlers coming into Camden Park. Some of them at first were squatters. Some of them were able to purchase or to rent land. And uh, Camden Park on the when, um, went through a lot of changes, became an industrial estate. And as you look down there, you could see the port. You could see some of the, the factories which were established there after it became an industrial center. The ex-slaves realized that they wanted to be free of the plantation. But they could only be free of the plantation if they, if they owned land. Some of them were, were able to move into the interior. But moving into the interior, it was difficult getting their produce to the market. The other thing is that the planters realized that if they sold land, even when they were in economic difficulty, if they sold land to these um, ex-workers, it meant that they would be less dependent on the estates. So an effort was made to prevent them from selling lands. And where they had land to sell, they were selling lands in large acreage, which meant only other planters could buy or maybe merchants. But fortunately, there are, there are examples, I think, in St. Vincent where churches at times came in and bought a portion of land which they divided up. And one of the major themes in Vincentian history is, has to do with land. And so from the time of um, Chatelier, when the British wanted to get rid of their land, right up until 1935 and even later on, the main thing driving Vincent was land. It was only after labor riots rocked the island in 1862 and sugar production continued to decline that the ownership of land became available to the former enslaved and some members of the native population. There was a gentleman who lived just above, us, above our house there. We were neighbors. He lived with the, the Vavors and the Sousa. And he was one of the foremost writers. When everyone felt that the riots were finished on October the 21st, October the 22nd, people came into Camden Park and targeted a Mr. D'Souza. Mr. D'Souza, um, I, I think he was Portuguese. He was accused of lending bullets to people from the militia. To, um, and as the people said when they started stoning his house and his, um, his store, oh, you, you, are, you are lending bullets to kill black people. And that was the... He was the target of the riots in Camden Park on the 22nd when, of course, on the 21st, you had riots in Kingston, um, Cane Garden, then out to places like jo in George, in the Georgetown Byra area. In the, in the heyday of the riots, he had got his eye blown out, but he still lived. <laughs> his name was the Souza, Anthony the Souza. So he had to hide in all the, some on the, the, the embankments here, on the vines and all that kind of stuff. And he used to, he used to, he used to tell us about his experiences. He's, he's a jerry boy. Letting them fellas come down there, cutlass and gun. He said he used to leave them go down in the back there, boy. Hide under the guy under the vines. And they come looking, they chopping, chopping, they can't find me. Boy, those are the days. And he would tell you, you know, the kind of experience, but they started over hate me. A half penny. You know, a one cent, <laughs> they, they increased the price of either matches or, or oil by one cent. And fellows started to go up in arms because there's plenty of money in them days. One cent, could you imagine? And the local rioters came out who were opposed to it. They went to Macintosh, 
who was the leader of the progressive movement at the time, George McIntosh, and um, he started igniting the people, organizing them. 1935 uprising was part of um, uprisings throughout the Caribbean. Not, not all the Caribbean colonies at that time, but St. Vincent was the second of the Caribbean colonies following St. Kitts. St. Vincent had its rights in October 1835, and it went to places like Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica, and Guyana. So the important thing is that the riots made the colonial authorities aware that something had to be done, that people were demanding certain things. One of the things they were demanding is um, rep better representation because St. Vincent and the, some of the smaller islands did not get adult suffrage. And adult, by adult suffrage, you mean that once you were 21, at that time, you were allowed to vote. Up to 1935, there was a high um, qualification you had to own a certain amount of land and um, or high income. But after the 1935 riots, when George McIntosh, who was singled out as leading the rioters, which he did not, he was simply trying to assist the rioters, and he was charged for treason. And um, when, he, when his case was dismissed, a number of the people, the ordinary folk in the country, who were who assembled outside the courthouse, lifted him on their shoulders, and that was the start of something because McIntosh realized that there were a number of people who were not represented. And based on that, he formed his own working men's association. And in the elections which followed, I think two years after, McIntosh was able to get into the Legislative Council where he remained until 1951 when you had um, the introduction of adult suffrage. And at that time in 1951 was when Joshua came on the scene and then Joshua was able to dominate politics in St. Vincent until the, um, until 1971-72. On the 1899 land settlement, Camden Park was one of those areas where a Carib village was established. In 1902, when they were looking for places to settle some of these people who were, well not forced, but who had to remove from the areas which were affected by the 1902 eruption, they got this area in Camden Park which they bought from the plantation or area that is called Carib Village. So a number of them went and lived in Carib Village. As a boy, when we came here in 1951, I never forget, that we used to be like little bear skin boys, you know, running up and down the court. There used to be a canal that they used to open and close to control the river coming down. It, it, it was constructed of stone and it went, there was, a, there was a, a big gate in the middle. We used to walk from one side of the road to the next to go over the Caribbean. You could walk from the main road. Much like the enslaved labor, most of the things that kept the plantation functioning to the benefit of the British Empire had to be imported as is still the case today. Most of it comes through this Camden Park port. The industrial complex is the main supply chain for businesses across the archipelago. It was in the 1940s that the government acquired Camden Park as a land settlement estate. And it was at that time they brought in the Camden Park experimental station. It was an agricultural station. And um, you began around that to have I mentioned before squatters and also people buying parts of the land. So what we see today is really the result of transformation over the years because government then moved from a focus on agriculture to try to attract industries and um, lately we have had the port and we still have a lot of factories around you know, beer factory, we have a container corporation and all of these. So as you look at um, Camden Park, it's really difficult to try and pull everything together because things are scattered and some of them are buried and you're not even sure exactly what they, what they were. But a number of them would have gone back to the days, to the, definitely to the days of, of slavery and the production of sugar. 
The estate lands pass through the hands of many businessmen and has been rebranded and developed into the most industrial zone on the island, second only to the country's capital, Kingston. It is usually busy with container traffic and company vehicles. It is also where the most profitable business in the country can be found. But for those employed in Camden Park and for Vincentians in general, this wealth and land is not available to them. More than a century later, the stains of slavery still remain. The tradition is still going on, my brother. It's never done. It's never end. The tradition of, of, of slavery with white people is still going on, my brother, that not, not have not ended. We free in, in a sense, it, it, like walking up on a, a, a free wall and them kind of thing. But when you, you check in heaven, we still not free, my brother. Because really and truly, we still have to go to them to sort new things. And if we not go through them process, we not get nothing. So really and truly, we still have to go to, to them to sort new things and dog under them to sort new things still. So it could never done. When the British left, the, the country was still undeveloped. There were not many schools. And the, the important thing is that when the British came in, they came in not to develop the country for the benefit of the incension, but to extract as much as they could from St. Vincent. So one of the things which is significant when people speak about reparations is the fact that the British left without even allowing, um, well not allowing, but giving the countries, not only St. Vincent, but the other colonies, enough capital to be able to allow them to make a start on their own. They still became dependent on Britain and, and, and other countries. From the time the Calinagos and the Garifuna, you had uh, Britain exploiting the land. And in fact, St. Vincent at one point became the second largest producer of sugar in the Caribbean. And that, that is very significant because it meant that a lot of the profits from sugar production remain not to develop St. Vincent, but for in England, so that when we speak about reparations, we're speaking not only about reparations for slavery, but reparations for the indigenous people, many of whom in 1797 were sent into exile in Central America, and um, the lands were taken, and it was those lands ranging from Grand Sable to right up to, to Fancy, it was those lands that um, were turned over, or sold to planters who were able to develop the sugar industry. And the reason why St. Vincent became the second producer of sugar for a period of time was that they were able to occupy these lands, which were, which were really very fertile virgin lands. So we, ne we did not benefit from those things. In fact, we suffered because there was a split now because only a few indigenous people remained. The majority went to Central America, and those who remained suffered a, a lot of hardships. Since the British tried to create a divide, a divide um, rule, tried to divide up the country and to um, turn the indigenous people against the African slaves. So there's a whole history there. If one has to do with the legacy, you know what, what are some of the problems which came about after the British left St. Vincent. Even during the, during the colonial period when they were here, there were quite a lot of problems. And we see not only in the 1935 riots, but immediately after slavery, you had uh, riots on the estates where people were demanding better working conditions, better wages. So there's a whole history that one could look at if one is dealing with the legacy of colonialism. The desire of the former enslaved to elevate their position could only be made a reality through land ownership. The subject of land, reclaiming and acquiring it, is a central focus of the people who were driven off of it and the ones who labored on it for free. Some Vincentians have been able to actualize this dream, while many others struggle to survive in the paradise of the Sugarlands. The Paradise Destination Dream is packaged and sold to tourists under the same ideologies of colonialism. 
The island's thriving tourism industry is built on the backs of workers who clean, serve and toil for meager wages. Mustique has always been a royally approved destination, dating back to Princess Margaret's days on the island. What is happening to the Grenadines as a whole is that when we speak about tourism, it's really about tourism for the rich. So the people who are benefiting it, these people who they give away a large portion of um, Canawan to these investors. The investors have changed, but the people who are living in Canawan now is although they, it's as if they're living in a foreign land, you know, in terms of their liberty. Mustique is even worse because of the kind of regulations which, which are put in place. So even though the British have left, well, in Canawan is not so much the British, but other, other investors, but in, in Mustique, you know, it has a, um, a relationship going back to the previous owners who were British. You know, so a, lo a lot of that continues today. There are people, there are people in Mustique who were born there. And at one time, they were not allowed to bury their dead there. That went on. I'm not sure what is the arrangement now. and kidnapping of our people. They are responsible for the transatlantic slave trade. They are responsible for slavery and they are responsible for colonialism. As a result of that, our people were completely devastated. We still here. We still here. And we want, we want reparations and compensation for the British genocide of our people. The Kalinago people, the Garifuna people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We came out to show our solidarity with the cause of reparation. Each one here can say they're reparationists. We're looking for our grandfather's back pay. We're looking for payment for the wrongs that was committed against our people. We're looking that the Queen of England and all her descendants must apologize, must give us what is duly ours. Reparations is a must. We hope that this fight will continue. Ones and ones will learn and the persons who are seen in the public would get a gist of what reparation is and would also stand in this fight. Because this is not a today thing, this is a continuous fight until the day when the Queen of England and her descendants acknowledge the wrong that they have committed. And acknowledging this wrong, they would apologize and they would look to restore and repair the wrong that they have done. So with repairing that wrong, we ask that they pay up. They pay from the monies that they have gathered and amassed, the gold that they have stuck pile, the golden carriages that they have, all the diamonds that they have and all the artifacts that they stole. It's not something that is unjust that we're asking. You worked our grandfathers and grandmothers and our aunties and our uncles without pay for 400 years. So now we're asking that you pay the labor that you achieved, that you acquired. We're asking that you pay for the loss of life. We ask that you pay for the emotional damage, the post-traumatic stress syndrome that we still have facing today. We ask that you pay up for the Willie Lynn syndrome that we still suffer from today. You understand? We ask that you pay up. The time is now. We're fed up. we reach to the point where there's no more smiley faces when they come to the Caribbean. And you can see the trend that's been happening throughout the region. Persons have reached the limit. We're no longer going to be docile peasants and say, OK, we welcome you, Queen and King of England and your descendants. No, you need to know that what you did was wrong. You need to know that the wealth that you have sitting on and your castles and all your wealth was acquired through an atrocity, through a genocide, through a holocaust. And you need to admit and correct that wrong. No! 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 
the lives of millions of men, women and children were destroyed in the search of profit. For over 400 years, enslaved Africans and their descendants were classified in law as non-human, chattel, property, real estate. They were denied recognition as members of the human family by laws derived from the parliaments and palaces of Europe. This history has inflicted tremendous psychological trauma on the descendants of the enslaved, as is evident by the daily lives of people living in the Caribbean. The healing process requires, as a precondition, a sincere formal apology from the governments of Europe and a serious effort towards reparatory justice. <laughs>